All right, guys, July 5th, we've got a special guest coming to the shop. It's Dan Brereton, and we're here to talk to him about nocturnals and what he has coming up. Well, Dan, thank you for coming down. Thanks for uh, having me. Thank you for being on the video. We've got something special coming up here at Empire uh, because you have something special coming up. Uh, it, and it's been in the works for a while. You've got a new nocturnal book, uh, nocturnal, sorry, book coming out. And we're going to have you down in here uh, July 5th to do a signing with us. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I've been doing nocturnals, the nocturnals comics since about 1994, I think is when the first one came out with Malibu Comics, Bravira, creator-owned line, Bravira. And there was, I was pretty young then. Um, and started with Howard Chaikin, Walt Simonson, Gil Kane, Mark Wolfman. Uh, what we all had in common was not that we were all equally as popular. <laughs> it was that we had the same um, uh, entertainment lawyer who put together this, uh, this kind of legend-like uh, line of creators for Malibu and at the time I was uh, trying to set up nocturnals with another company and uh, um, my attorney slash agent slash whatever you would call it Harris Miller oh, yeah. says you know I have another another publisher who I'm setting stuff up with and when he explained to me what was going on I was like are you kidding I, I, I don't rate to be with those guys Chaykin, Simonson, Gil Kane it's a little intimidating. Uh, uh, right off Stephen the bat. Grant, you know, who, who was the one that brought the Punisher back into, you know, a really powerful sort of you know, top-selling character. I mean, yeah, I just felt completely out of place. But so I published uh, a one-shot through Dark Horse about a year or two later. Um, then we moved over from Dark Horse to Oni Press. Did a book called Dark Forever with them, uh, which was another mini series. Okay. And so I've kind of bounced around since then. And uh, the last place before now was Image. We put out uh, a collection of uh, like the second sort of hardcover volume of uh, material, and that was, I think, in 2008. So from 2008 until now, uh, we have a new graphic novel coming out. <clears throat> it's called The Sinister Path, Nocturnals, The Sinister Path. Um, it's, uh, it's a 96-page story. We funded it on Kickstarter in 2015. And yeah, it should be in stores in July. That's great. I mean, and of course, guys, we're going to have plenty. There's going to be a blank cover uh, to the trade. There's also going to be uh, the standard cover. Yeah, sketch um, cover and, uh, and the regular soft cover edition, yeah. And uh, Kickstarter, I mean, how amazing is it that you have access to this kind of stuff nowadays? Oh, I mean, because you probably had to really bust your butt in the past to get these things done. Well, see, that's one of the reasons why a creator-owned book like The Nocturnals had to bounce around. I mean, a lot of creator-owned books have bounced around. Um, because you know you own the material, you are the one who's probably profiting more than than a, you know, let's say a publisher who's putting out that money. Then they have to wait for the return while you paint the book, because this is a painted, uh, fully painted book. And we'll show you some examples of his work here in a minute. You guys will understand just how much work goes into this. Yeah, it takes a while, and it's not that I'm slow. Um, I actually did an issue of Punisher a few years back where I had about the same amount of time that a pencil or ink or colors team would have, and I did it. It was hard. Okay. And I know it's, I think I think that's, I mean, that just goes to the whole uh, job of, of making comics. You know, if you're just a penciler, or if you're just an inker or a colors, it's a lot of work, and making deadlines is tough. And uh, I had somewhat of a deadline with this Kickstarter book because we had backers who were waiting. Yeah, and it um, promises. Yeah, and they, and you know, they're kind of, they, they put their faith in you, mm -hmm. and um, I've, all, for years, though, I mean, we're talking almost 30 years that I've been doing this, that faith that people put in you, it extend, it's extended to publishers, to fans, um, you know, to the people that you're working with when you're collaborating. And so that's not a new thing for me, but having that connection to the people waiting to read it as direct and immediate as Kickstarter is, is a completely new uh, sensation, you know, where people have come to me and say, hey, what's going on? Or I'm so excited about it. Or can I do this? Or you wouldn't, you know, they want to know what's going on. And they, and there's, it's so much easier to get a hold of a creator or than it used to be. Or anyone, everyone can get a yes. hold of everybody now. Um, I, I actually thrive in that. It's, um, it takes a lot more time out of your day, but it's still, I think, very worthwhile. 
Well, and you always have quite a presence at the cons. I mean, you're, you've are you been doing them for, for a good long while. And one of the things that us comic fans really appreciate is we like having that connection with our creators. We like knowing who put this together, you know, because it's much more personal than a lot of other mediums. Yeah. So it's nice that I see you at the cons. And I, and I've come up and talked to you. I've seen you talk to other people for years. Um, you're always, there's always a connection with your fans. And, uh, and they seem to follow you no matter what you do. I think... Um, you know, when you go to a comic book show, it is kind of a microcosm, you know. Um, but uh, when you when you're doing like a local, like because you know, I live in the Sacramento area, yeah. so I'm doing the Sacramento shows probably more than anything else. And you see the same people over and over again. And, and Comic Con San Diego is very similar. It's like it's like lunchtime at high school. So everybody knows everybody, you okay. know. And um, you you have that connection with people. It's, it's, it's brief. And it, it might not be for another year, but mm-hmm. I've, I've talked about this before, but it's when you get back with these people, it's like no time has gone by and you're all sort of back in that little sort of microcosm yeah. uh, comic book verse. And it's, it's, it's very comfortable and uh, it is a great way to connect with people. It's, 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 it's been a real challenge to have that kind of a connection with a wider base of people. And it helps to have social media, but even with social media, you're still not reaching everyone. No. I mean, a year after the Nocturnals Kickstarter, I had people who were Facebook friends and had been Facebook friends for a long time saying, you did a Nocturnals Kickstarter? I wish I'd known about it. It's like, I don't know what else to do. Yeah, yeah, you're like, like I, I, I posted, do? I, uh, we sent I, out I emails. I to the point <laughs> where I always think about friends of mine who are on Facebook who are also comic book uh, creators mm-hmm. who I know, and every time I'm posting about the Nocturnals for the nth time, whatever, um, I think, oh, you know, Mike Mignola's going to see this. He's going to be like, Rolling his eyes, or well, Liam Sharp <laughs> is going to see this, and they're just going to. And then, you know, obviously, it's not, I'm not doing it for them, but I always feel like these people must think I'm just oversaturating. But really, what I'm doing is I'm hitting little pockets of people every time. Yes. And it, you really can't do it enough, you know, if you. If not when you're trying, especially when you're trying to do something like that with the Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, and especially building up to the release with it coming, you want to make sure retailers know. You want yeah. to make sure that oh. people, even you're not in Sacramento, or even if you are and you don't shop here all the time, uh, I said all the time because I, I know you come by once in a while. Uh, make sure you let your retailer know that you want a copy of this. Make sure that you say, hey, yeah, um, pick this yeah. up because I would like to get this. And as we said, there is a blank cover and a regular cover. Yeah. I think it's the only it's the only trade paperback format that has a sketch cover, which is not easy to do, one. because a regular sketch cover is a saddle stitched affair with staples, mm-hmm. and because we're not doing you know this is a different binding, we had to figure out how to make that work, because uh, normally a sketch cover is just sort of a stiffer, you know, stock that's sort of laid over the original comic, and we realized we couldn't do that, so we had to come up with something interesting. Um, but I yeah I I'm just. I, it's been interesting how there's these, these phases to to the to the production of this thing that just you can't plan for everything because you know for instance that you're going to put the book out and the backers are going to get their copies and they're going to get their rewards mm-hmm. you know that the book is going to go out through diamond but your head can't really wrap around how much work that is and how much time that takes you know and somehow I managed to still paint and draw at the same time I'm doing all this this sh- juggling. And when I started comics back in, what, 88, it was my first job, they did not want you doing any of that stuff. The publishers were like, you just make your deadlines, we'll take care of the rest. And for years it was like that. And it wasn't until I got in with the Bravira Boys that uh, it was, I was sort of Sound shaken dangerous. out of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really do. Well, being in a room with Howard Shaken can be can seem dangerous. Um, but uh, it wasn't until that point that I was... Re- sort of required to be a member of this sort of marketing sales gotcha. think okay. tank. And uh, it, was, it was a good a good education. Um, and we didn't have social media back then. so No, that must have been rough. And especially now that you're doing it all yourself, it was a great way to break in and to figure out how to, how yeah. to do that. Um, well, let's show you guys the books. We haven't shown anything. Uh, I, we were just assuming that you guys know uh, what Nocturnals is because it's been around forever. Um, here's a nice little hardcover. Uh, volume two that's available. Um, this one was the most recent one, correct? Yeah. Um, this is okay. well. This is the original. This is the uh, this is the latest reprinting of the first volume, yes. Black Planet, which is the first Nocturnal mini series, and it's been in a few different printings. But this okay. is the most recent one. 
that came um, out. And there's hardcover and cover. soft cover it's available. Soft cover. It's a soft cover edition. Um, this one comes in hardcover. There was a hardcover uh, volume one that came out in 2006, and we have we have we bought up the stock of those. Big Wow owns them, and we're figuring out how to, how to get them out to people that don't have them. And I think what we'll Excellent. probably do is use them as add-ons or, or rewards for the next Kickstarter when I eventually do. When you the, go for the next one. When I go for the next Nocturnal's graphic novel, yeah. There's also, guys, this one is the best way to see what you're looking at. I mean, just look at the, it's bigger, you can see the, the, the actual paintings there. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is unique about you. I mean, obviously in the comic industry, especially today when everybody goes immediately to computers for coloring. Yeah. Um, I mean, why don't you pull out a page and show them? Sure. Uh, when you guys, I, I'm always reminding you guys how much goes into a comic that you guys don't know about because you've got layouts, you've got pencils, you've got inks, colors, lettering. And then, you know, as I said, most of the coloring is done on, on a computer, not to downgrade that because it's not easy. But this man does everything. I mean, what's the process on this? Is it watercolors? It's uh, it's watercolors part of it, but mostly it's it's acrylic gouache. Gouache was a, is like a designer's medium. It's a water base. It, you can go opaque, thick with it, but you can also go transparent. And um, this one is uh, different from regular gouache in that it's acrylic, so when it dries, it's permanent. Okay. And uh, my wife was working at Utrecht in Sacramento uh, years ago before the birth of our first child, and. She brought home these uh, Holbein acrylic gouache tubes, and I was like, oh, let's check these out. And um, I just got hooked on them. So what I do is, is basically I start out with, um, you know, the pencils. I, I do, you know, I, I do my thumbnail roughs. Uh, they're usually they're about this big to about the size of a composition notebook. And I'll fill up the composition notebook with my layouts for the story. They're very, very, very loose and sloppy. But I can read them. Okay. And that's the important part. Um, and then from there, I, uh, I gather um, some models together when I need reference for more complicated angles and perspectives and, and things like that, um, and transform them into these monster people uh, by penciling the pages based on my layouts. And um, then I go with a wash of watercolor over everything after it's taped down to the board. This is a Strathmore Bristol board. And then I just go panel to panel. Um, you try and work into all of them sort of at the same time, but you tend to sort of focus on one at a time. Uh, the, I, the idea is, to, is for every page to work as one unit rather than four or five or six little separate pictures. They yes. should all cohere. That's why I'll, I'll put this one down and show you. Pull up another one. Um, that's why it's important to sort of, uh, I like this one here, another sort of color scheme. And you can just kind of see how everything. I mean, look at the, all the detail in the background. There's so <laughs> many little things back there. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun to. I, this is why I think one of the reasons why I enjoy oops, um, the character of Halloween Girl at Evening because she is a toy collector, and all of her toys are possessed by departed spirits, and um, so she's never alone. She's got a big gaggle of of friends in these toys, and um, it gives me the chance to kind of just go wild with uh, imagining these sort of spooky, weird stuffed animals and, and strange uh, sort of vintage toys. And, and it also works into the story as well. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I love the, the fact that I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but there's, there's sometimes when people do painted stuff like this, it, it almost feels like each one is a cover. There's not a lot of motion. Whereas you're able to capture all that and make it feel more like a comic well, book as an, in, instead of an individual picture. I, I think that, um, I, you know, like I said, you don't want to name names or anything like that because I've been accused of that too. I've been accused of being too static too. Really? Sure. Um, everyone's got an opinion about, about something. All right, but, fair um, I, you know, for me, it's very much like uh, seeing the story moving in my head mm -hmm. and I'm trying to capture that as best I can. At the same time, you don't want to get bogged down in rendering. Uh, rendering as in, when I, what I mean by rendering is is trying to get all the detail perfect. And I got a really good tongue lashing from the great Bern Hogarth back in 1989 after my first book came out, The Black Terror, which is the first painted book I did with Eclipse Comics. And I met Bern at a show in San Francisco. And uh, for those of you who don't know Bern Hogarth, he, he authored the uh, Dynamic Anatomy, yep. Heads and Hands books, he drew Tarzan. This, he reinvented anatomy. Um, and people used to look, at, people still do look at his books and try and scratch their heads and figure out how do I learn how to draw the human figure 
from a guy who redesigned it, you know? And I met him at the show. I showed him some of my work, and he just blasted me for, uh, I guess he was a big fan of comic books uh, that were painted, because he felt that the artists were putting too much work into every panel rather than servicing the story at large. And as much as it was painful and not an experience I'd want to relive, having this this basic, this giant in comic book storytelling and art kind of um, give me this lecture, I found out later that that's what he did for everybody. And I learned a lot from it, um, definitely. It's nice that you can take something away from that. I mean, you know, we, we all have stuff to learn. And yeah, maybe his presentation could have been better, but there, there's, there's, you know, something well, it made his impact. Take out. He made his impact. I mean, he was a teacher, so I think he... I think he knew exactly what he was doing to me, but um, <laughs> I, yeah, I have to I have to say that there were moments like that when I was coming up uh, in my freshman years of comics, where I wasn't sure how I was going to fit in the comic book industry because mm -hmm. I started out as a penciler, yeah, and the results, uh, if I remember correctly, from my editor was that uh, the publishers were mildly unimpressed with with the results. I was still in art school at the time; um, I didn't have a handle on anything yet. But I, I knew when I saw the work of um, guys like Kent Williams, George Pratt, and Dave McKean, who at the time in 1989 or 88 were all working on their painted graphic novels. Uh, like Dave McKean was still painting Black Orchid. Kent Williams was had just done Blood. I was seeing their work in these big pages, and um, I just I got really depressed because I realized that that's really what I want to be doing, you know, and I just didn't know how to get there. So after that, that year at San Diego of meeting these guys and seeing their work, I endeavored to try and do that painted style and use the stuff I was learning in art school as an illustration major to, uh, to do the first seven pages of what would become the Black Terror story. And from then on, I was just doing painted stuff all through the 90s. I was booked up a year in advance doing one project or another. Um, and as the digital age started to creep toward us, the painted stuff backed off more. You had guys like Alex Ross, with very iconic, detailed, crisp style that lends itself perfectly to uh, comic book covers and storytelling, um, sort of at the fore. But a lot of painted stuff was taking a back seat to the digital. Uh, it's just eye candy. It's just, you know, okay. painted comics used to, was the old eye candy in a lot of ways. You know, just like coloring comics, is when the, when the, Malibu was publishing Image. They had a uh, the first digital coloring system, which is largely why Marvel bought them in, their, in the mid-90s. I didn't know that, actually. Because of their coloring system. That was the main reason that they could... They had this way of uh, putting the books together um, with a computer that was innovative. And it really did change the industry, if you think about it. I mean, you know, look at the superstars we have, like, like Laura Martin, you know, a friend of mine who's a supremely talented individual and uh, one of the top colorists, because she just really took to the form. And there's so much more. If you go on Instagram, I mean, you know, I go on Instagram and I just get blown away daily by Some the stuff, stuff that people, that people are, doing are able to put out digitally, yeah. and it kind of depresses me. I really shouldn't do it in the morning before I've started to go to work. But, some, but what I try and do is make that feeling of, oh, I, I'm worthless, turn that into, um, you know, the desire to do better. Always, right, when it's turned it around, and the desire to do better. I think that's something you learn early on in art school when, your teacher comes in and shows you the stuff that they're doing in the real world of uh, illustration. Um, a lot of my teachers at the, the academy in San Francisco were working illustrators. And sometimes they bring their work in and it would just really blow us away. And you have to take that feeling of like just feeling this big and turn it around into the, the determination to do, to do your best. And I still do that every day. Every single day, every painting, every panel, every drawing, I'm trying to... Uh, to learn things if I can and to be honest I didn't, I learned more probably my first five years of doing comics um, professionally uh, just by sitting there and trying to imagine what my teacher would say about what I was doing standing over my shoulder like force ghosts that still happens I think everybody out there who wants to be in comic books whether you're a writer colorist artist I think you should really just rewind that last five minutes and listen to it again because it can be intimidating, especially trying to get in when yeah. there's so many people, especially in today's market where you have such access to seeing those things on Instagram and such. And and just take what he said to, to heart because you got to turn that around and you got to use it as inspiration as opposed to letting it beat you down. I have the same um, 
struggle as a person who's been doing this for nearly 30 years as people who, who want to get into the business, which is I'm trying to put my best foot forward all the time so that people will want to pick up the work and read it. You know, um, it's not even about trying to get the top sales. I don't know who's interested in getting top sales. I think people down the line from the guy who's doing his own stuff in, you know, in between the time he's working a day job all the way up to people who are, who are very sort of on the top 10 list of comic sales. They're just do, trying to do their best. They're trying to tell a great, a great story. Um, they're trying to write one. They're trying to illustrate one. For me, with the Nocturnals, it's a great way for me to flex both my muscles as a writer and an artist because they are very different muscles in a lot of ways. I think it all comes from the same place of wanting to tell a story, it's, but the, the techniques are so different. When I finished um, the last, the 96th page of Nocturnals, I had already been thinking about the dialoguing and things like that for, well, the whole time I'm working on it. Yeah. It's in my head, but to sit down in front of your computer and then write it it's a whole other discipline. And I had to kind of reorient myself because it's been a while since I've written, writ, written anything like that, written a script or anything. Um, so I had to reorient myself. I had to sit down, I sat down and I read a bunch of comics mm -hmm. to kind of get that, that sort of cadence back, back and feel, everything. Yeah. And, and, and I read some of the stuff I had done. And once it comes back, it's sort of, you know, you do get into a groove, but it's very easy to kind of um, go down the rabbit hole as a writer, just, to, just as you can with an artist. You have to be disciplined. You have to uh, have to ask yourself a lot of questions. You know, does this work? Does this serve the story? What does that mean? Even serve the story? I think when you when you're doing comics, I think you have the same responsibility as a screenwriter uh, or someone writing a TV show or a novelist or a short story writer to make things clear, understandable, and not get bogged down in the nuances and the clever little symbolism and things like that. You still want to sell, tell a strong, simple story. And then you add the layers to that. And the layers are either on top of it, or under it, or alongside it. And uh, some of that stuff you can plan and a lot of it you can't. Okay. It just requires a lot of practice. And, I mean, he's had plenty of volumes in, what do we get, 30 years worth of uh, work under your belt? So Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. I, I wish I'd put out more, actually, to be honest. I mean, I, 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 um, I would like to be doing Nocturnals all the time. You know, it would have been great to have to have the had uh, you know, a nearly 30-year career where I was doing a new book every year. On the other hand, there's an argument for doing high-profile stuff um, in between, which a lot of creators do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and you've had your fair share of high-profile stuff as well. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing more covers for Marvel and stuff uh, late when they do call me to do a cover. Um, but uh, yeah, I've worked on all kinds of. I mean, from Spider-Man, I did an issue of. Uh, Ultimate Team Up, um, Punisher. Uh, oh, this is interior Batman. stuff we're talking about. Yeah, Bat. I just I have a Batman thing out now on uh, DC Digital and Comicsology. Mm -hmm. It's Legends of the Dark Knight number eighty-five through eighty-eight. It's called Six Fingers. Okay, if you yeah, haven't you seen that, it you should check it out. It, it's not come out in print yet, but um, I like the way it looks with the guided view on Comicsology. I okay. think it it's pretty cool. Um, the intuitiveness of being able to go back and forth from panel to panel or page to page or the things that you can do with your fingers when you want to get in there and, and look move around the story okay. are, it's a little are, are neat. You know, um, I, I'm not a big digital comics. I don't even read stuff on Kindle. I like to read an actual book I like to have in my hands. But for me, that was kind of an eye-opener to see what, it's like made fire. Just to see what they can do with the, the capabilities yeah. to help move the story along, I think, are pretty neat. Okay. That's, so you guys, we'll have links to a lot of this stuff for you. Um, so. One of the things that I find neat that you do is, since you do a lot of reference with models, mm -hmm. um, there you throw in people, even in the background, who might not be main characters. Uh, you were showing me a bar scene mm -hmm. in this one, where we've got people who are from the Kickstarter who made it onto the page. Um, you've had friends. You throw people, uh, like pictures in the mansion will be people you actually know. Yeah. Um, but there's one particular page that we were looking at earlier uh, with uh, kind of a seedy looking character. I think you captured his likeness <laughs> pretty close. Um, and here we got uh, the man who made Come it into in his here. book, uh, Mr. Cody Stark. Uh, Thank you, sir. There we go, guys. This right here. Look at that. Is that not like dead on? <laughs> look, look at that. He didn't wear his necklace today. 
uh, but he I usually know. has it. Uh, uh, welcome to the Where show, you sir. You're, 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 that's that's right there. That is perfect. So tell me a little bit about this guys. You guys have known each other for a while, and you're, yeah. a, you're a big fan. I'm a huge of, fan. Of Dan. Huge fan. Yeah. Uh, the nocturnal stuff. Uh, a, I wanted to ask you this. Have you ever been to therapy? And, and <laughs> if you haven't, do not go. <laughs> because some of the stories and things that you put in here, I'm like, oh, now yes. if he talks to a therapist, he's never going to let these things out of his head it's again. It's all going to be done. All of a sudden, it's a completely I different kid, book. This is totally therapy. I mean, it's been my therapy for, since I was a little taught, is being able to get the stuff out and onto the page. So, I mean, it's definitely therapeutic to work in. Because you spend so much time alone thinking while you're painting yeah. and you're in your head's in the story, your head's in other places. So yeah, it's definitely my theory for sure. I think I think a lot of artists and writers would tell you that. Definitely. Okay, yeah. just getting it out, getting it to the page. Sure. Um, now and you can you can really appreciate what he does because you actually went to art school. I do well I plunked at art school. Well yes. you still went to art school. I, I I was just fudging it a little bit. Uh, oh I I went and then they said we need you to leave right now because your checks are bouncing. <laughs> it was in Alabama. Uh, and and I, I, that, that was a good accent. The important part yeah. of high school is paying the bill. Yeah. Like, they don't care if you can draw or paint. I honestly feel like flunking out of art school in Alabama means you're pretty good. Well, <laughs> <laughs> probably. I mean, <laughs> We didn't burn the book that you made. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, I went to art school in Alabama, and I thought I, I really wanted to design greeting cards. That's what I mm. thought I was going to do. Re, re, okay, yeah. that is the first time I've ever heard, ever heard anybody say <laughs> I really I'm wanted to put it. Yeah. I'm going to put it out there and say that I think the greeting cards are cool, and I think that some of my favorite artists were greeting card guys. Uh, okay. Um, like uh, Peter Hawley is uh, an illustrator who did a lot of greeting card work in the 60s and 70s. Usually the cute, really super cute kids. Okay. Like Valentine's. I used to love his stuff. I'm still a huge fan. Turns out he did. All, he had a whole other career doing other things. But no, I think there's a lot to be said for green cards. I mean, um, well, I'm just. I kind of. You know, comics was something I gravitated to early on. But um, illustration in general is just amazing. What you can the different deals you can get into. So there, there are quite I, a lot. Of I'm gonna. That. I'm gonna yes. back you up on that. <laughs> Done. Uh, yeah. Let's notice. So good have, have you, sorry, good day, Sacramento. I'm done. Yeah. He's, he's greeting doing cards. greeting cards now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Have, have you ever made a greeting card? Just that. I yeah. have. We actually did. Um, we had the people from Hallmark in. I think it was like six or seven years okay. ago. And every once in a while, I'll do like Cody's line of inappropriate greeting cards and stuff, and I'll do it on my <laughs> weather computer and stuff. And uh, but they came in, and I did like a whole line of them. And the, the guy pulled me aside. And he goes, "These aren't bad." <laughs> and I was like, like "Well." If, yeah. only, if only I'd heard that uh, 20 years That's ago. That's right. No, they're pretty bad. They're, they're just all sort of sarcastic and weird. I've been thinking about People actually like, doing a whole yeah. thing of cards based on, like, news. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, like, so when you open it up, it has, like, news music and stuff like that, you know, and just, like, uh, this just in. Oh. Forest fire starts from your cake, you know, yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I, it's great. not too late to change careers. It's true. That sounds good. And I, I believe my boss would agree with you on that. He's like, Cody, it's time for you. <laughs> oh my God. Time to go. He, he just doesn't take a hit. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let's go back because I'm, I'm really uh, old. Uh, did I force you to put me in the comic? I can't remember no. how this happened. I remember we were doing I an interview. I strong armed you. No, I am, um, you know, you uh, were so gracious to have me on the show a few times and um, always so... I don't know, like enthusiastic. Um, that really helps, by the way, when there's people you know are waiting for things who are excited about stuff. It really helps spur you on. So that's important. But I, I am. Um, I knew I had this rogues gallery of sort of near to wells in this one scene, and um, I thought I got to put Cody in here. That would be so much fun to put Cody in here. And so yeah, after I did um, my last appearance, I pulled Cody aside and he gave me his best tough guy grimaces and. And um, I I'd love to the see scene. the original picture. I want you should put them side by side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we can see <laughs> what Cody looks like when he's trying to act out. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he looked like a good day guy who was slightly miffed at you. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and I think I was like, you know, hold this like it's a beer bottle, and it was probably like a cup of coffee or something like that. But uh, when I got to the point where I'm, you know, in the world of the nocturnals, where people have to look very dangerous and seedy. I thought Cody's not going to work in here. He just looks too personable, you know. So I had to really, you know, I bulked him up. I gave him the bling, you know. <laughs> He's got the little, uh, you know, what do you call that? The 
like a little the tiniest of goatees. Yeah, the tiniest goatee. And um, you know, he's got a 32 inch neck. Mm -hmm. And I thought he's gonna get a kick out of this. He's gonna he's gonna like this. This works. So yeah, I think it, I think it was a it was a good. A good it turned out great. I didn't it really notice the difference. It, it, look, it looks well, dead ben, on. Ben actually knows the seedier side of me, so he's like, "Oh yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it." Uh, well, the that, seedier side it looks inside. great. It looks really fun. I mean, and yeah, you've also fun. on the same page. You've got people who back the Kickstarter, correct? Yes. Um, there were. Uh, we think we offered like five slots for people who wanted to have a cameo in the book, and they they contributed, um, you know, very generously toward that. And so, yeah. Um, I some people show up in the bar, where you know where they where it was more appropriate to have them in the scene. And actually, got some people who came to Comic Con who backed this, and I actually got to photograph them. Cool. There's one couple who appear in more than one panel, and that was great because it wasn't just like a head popping up, you know. So there's a couple of people who show in more than you know show up more than once in the scene. And then and then the earlier scene in the story, it's kind of like a haunted mansion type of uh, scene, and some people showed up as uh, in portraits on the walls. Which are kind of eerie and spooky, um, and I wish I could have done, you know, ten more pages of that stuff. I, I could do a whole book set in a haunted mansion. That would be, I would love that. I would so buy that. My favorite ride yeah. Disneyland. I could totally ride buy that. Yeah, well, I mean, I tried to get as much of that as I could in this story. Um, I think uh, if you ever wanted to see a Nocturnal's haunted house story, this is definitely going to satisfy that that bizarre craving. Um, but there's a whole other aspect as well, and I. It's funny when I'm when you're working on something and you want it to have that impact. It's like I, you want to go in cold, so it's been really tough. I want to show people, you know, previews from the book, but at the same time, I don't want to give anything away. And when I did the Batman book, I never mentioned witches uh, when I was telling people about it because I wanted that to be a, a, a reveal. And um, it turns out that you probably got to let people know if there's something cool in there. You should probably let them know what's cool in there because <laughs> they want to know. It's like you know, it's like when you see a you know a trailer, you you want to know why you should go see it you just don't need to know all the particulars and it's a really fine line i mean it's not my game i'm not a marketing person you know i'm i'm it's it's all new to me so i'm i'm trying whatever works but uh i i've teased out panels from the book um the last two years as i've been working on it and i'm and i got to the point where it's like well if i was paying if i was a person who was waiting for this and i was really paying attention how much of these panels could I pull out, and how much of the story could I put together <laughs> from all this stuff that I've um, I've teased online? And it's probably a pretty decent amount. <laughs> I mean, I hope it's not too much. But uh, <clears throat> do no, you I, think that the way that you're doing this, because you're painting them, it, to me, you were saying like the the, the motion and everything, uh, you got knocked on about that. But when I see oh, this, yeah, but it was it's you know, this this to me. Is so different from anything else you see. Like you said, like every every single panel is something that I would like to frame and put in my house mm, if thanks. my wife would not divorce me. <laughs> um, do you think that that this could come back doing comics this way, or is it just too big of a pain there? Well, I would or, like, I would love that. But you know, when I when I'm sitting in a comic book store and I look around, I just look at covers. I I, I personally, I, you know. I respond to the sort of traditional black line and, well, now traditional computer coloring. It's, I guess that's traditional now, but I, I respond to that. I responded to it when I was a kid. I respond to it now, but I also respond to uh, a wonderful painted illustration. So for me, it's all, it's all of a piece, you know. Uh, as far as it coming back as a boom like it did in the um, early to mid-90s, I don't know. I mean, I think that the... the Things have to keep moving forward. I feel like there's a place uh, in the comic book sort of milieu, the, the industry, for any kind of um, visual storytelling or any kind of style. But uh, I mean, you know, I always hope that, that the stuff will come back in vogue because it means that there'll be more demand. I mean, there are things I want to do in comics that I haven't done yet. Um, I, I've done Batman. I enjoy doing Batman. I did the Justice League. Uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of different. Uh, Vampirella, Red Sonia, I mean, fit characters that were fun to work on. I still do them through commissions. What's great about a commission is someone says, I want you to do this character, or you think, oh, I love that character. A commission is great because I don't have to paint a whole story with that character. Mm -hmm. I can just do one or two pieces, and that's that I'm good. Um, but when it comes to st storytelling with something like Nocturnals or a character that I have like a real affinity for that I didn't create, I do want to tell stories. And when a painted artist or the painted style when it is popular, 
means that you're probably going to have more of a chance to be able to do that because the sales will be there. You know, there was a point in the 90s where if you painted comics, you were doing great. I mean, uh, early in the 90s, anyone could hold a brush could get a, a, a Captain America graphic novel. I mean, well, now were, you tell me. <laughs> well, there were people who were, I think, I, I don't want to, I don't want to like uh, throw anyone under the bus, but there were varying levels of skill, let's say, okay. in those books that the big publishers were putting out, and they didn't all, they weren't all consistent, and that was just because there was such a demand for it, and um, I, I hope that it comes back into vogue because I like seeing it, you know. Um, I think there are some really really talented people out there. They're coming out of art school, who are self-taught, who um, don't get the chance to maybe do that kind of storytelling. There are also artists like Greg Tacchini, who works in all kinds of different ways. He works traditionally, digital, uh, works traditionally, digitally, he paints. I just a book, Low, which I'm sure you, I don't know if you, if you read that book, mm -hmm. you should. Mm -hmm. Rick Remender writes Wonderful. it. I just did a variant cover for them. Oh, really? Yes, I think it's gonna be out in September. That's yeah, I should have brought that, but I didn't. Maybe next time. But. Um, I, uh, when I saw the book, because Rick said, hey, do you want to do a cover, he sent me uh, a bunch of the issues on, through the Dropbox folder and PDF form, and I was like, why would they want me to do a cover? This guy's amazing. You know, it was one of those, ugh, okay, I got to work harder. You know, it was totally a situation where it was like, I couldn't understand why they wanted me to do a cover. It's a variant cover, obviously. It's not taking the place of this artist, but... Uh, I couldn't understand why they would think the fans would want to see my work, but I think it's more that like Rick and I have just known each other for years, and we've worked together on Punisher, Frank, and Castle, and, and I had a great time. So it was really great to have the opportunity to do it and to reach that audience, too. Hopefully, we'll bring more people in. To, you always want to bring more people into what you're doing. I mean, I could be doing the Justice League and Superman and Batman for 10 years like I did, basically, off and on with DC projects. You're not still not going to grab people uh, to come in and see the Nocturnals because they want superheroes. People were very, very, a lot of readers were very sort of grounded in their little narrow uh, spaces about w what they want to see in a comic, and superheroes are always going to prevail there, you know. Um, I think that when you go outside of superheroes, like I did at a certain point when I was younger, you it opens your head up, explodes your head. So I always, I, you know, I always recommend that. And Lowe's a perfect place for that. I mean, if the, the fans of Lowe, if they haven't seen you or checked out Nocturne, it's a great place for them to get a little piece of you and go look at it because, I mean, it, you know. Well, when that cover comes out, yeah, in September. Um, I think if you if you want to see stuff I've done that's not nocturnal, it's like it's more mainstream, you can check out the uh, Punisher, Punisher Frankencastle um, collected edition. You might you might even have it in store somewhere. I'm surprised that I, did, I, did, I painted two issues of that. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, God Size Thor, I did, I did a uh, one of the stories in God's Size Thor. I basically retold a Walt Simonson story from the 80s. And I used to read Walt Simonson's story in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then they said, we're doing a retelling of the story with the Executioner. So I, they didn't tell me that they were actually putting Walt's story in the book with mine. Because I, I, th well, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to just try and do my version of that sort of pen and ink with coloring style. Yeah. And it wasn't like I just did a carbon copy of it. But yeah. it's kind of neat because you can see the... the and compare where you know sort of like the source material where it came from and I sort of me putting my spin on it but um, it was also daunting to have the original material in the same way I can imagine right now but uh, I had a lot of fun doing that too it was, um, it was a real blast uh, Iron Fist um, I think it was I did an Iron Fist annual Mortal Iron Fist annual uh, that was uh, I did the painted cover and then I did a good part of the, the good portion of the interior um, I think that uh, I while I see the reason why computer colors over inks are much more prevalent in comics is graphically, you know, they, they just, they, they look good on the page. Again, like, I feel like there's room for, for, for everything, you know, and as printing gets better, because printing wasn't always so great in the 90s, um, you, you, you would do this beautiful cover, and the cover somehow would come out just fine, but then the interior pages would be washed out looking. And there were people who came to me, a couple of people come to me at shows and said, you know, um, I used to not like your work until I saw the originals and I could see what you were doing and what they, what, they were, they, what was getting lost in the printing. Mm -hmm. And that really gets you. Because when you notice it, it's one thing, but people always say, oh, people you're the only one going to notice that. When other people notice it, that's a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, I've had even Alex Ross have told me the same thing. Uh, you know, that when he was um, looking at the interior pages for uh, Kingdom Come, you know, all beautifully painted stuff, that the colors and the contrast were subdued compared to what the originals look like. And so it's 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 comforting to know that you can get a better reproduction um, than you used to be able to. Nice, and the new one's coming soon, guys. Uh, July 5th, we're gonna have this gentleman down here. Uh, check the Facebook page for details. Uh, he'll have some original artwork to show you. Of course, the books will be available. Um, do you have anything else? You got any prints or um, any fun stuff? I'll bring prints. I always have prints, um, you know, because people wanna see other stuff, which I'm totally down with. I will have the sketch covers with us too, so if, um, you know, I'll probably have time to do some, some sketches on, on the covers of some of these books. For folks, and uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Okay, that's it'll be some drawing and some signing and talking. Just chatting. hanging out, guys. Come down and meet yeah. him. Uh, pick up the book. Let me know uh, if I've got a lot coming in, but let me know if you want one so I can make sure I hold it for you because I'd hate for you to come down that evening and find out to, uh, you know, we, we got yeah, great success. And we, we've been perusing it. You want? Yes, <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, you want. Definitely, you definitely want, want it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Cody. Good to see you uh, I can't wait to see uh, his new oh, actual book, uh, <laughs> his comic book uh, debut. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Congratulations on a successful Kickstarter and thank getting you. this book out to people. And as he said, guys, uh, he takes care of his Kickstarter fans. So follow him over on Kickstarter. Follow him on Instagram, Facebook. We'll have all the links for you down below. So just follow him. A new it. Kickstarter. Uh, I think it's going to be launching pretty soon here. It might be late June Okay. Um, for a new art book. It's called In the Night Studio, and uh, so check, you know, I'll, I'll be, you know, hitting Facebook and Instagram and stuff to sort of announce that when that happens. But uh, All right, check for it. Yeah. It could be late June, um, and it's just in time for you coming down on July 5th to talk to people and uh, yeah. make sure they head yeah, on over. Sure. So, uh, again, follow them on uh, Facebook. It sounds like that's where a lot of the activity is going to be. And, of course, go look for them on Kickstarter because you can get notifications when they start. And let me tell you yeah. this. I don't care if I ever win an Emmy. God knows I probably won't. <laughs> That's so much cooler than an Emmy did. It's so much cooler you than an Emmy. Well, you I'll made have to his do it day. Again. I, I'm already, my wheels are already turning how to get you in the next one, so we'll figure something kill out. Kill me off good, man. Kill me <laughs> off good. Well, well, you know, in this book, you can get killed off and you can still bring you back. That's right. So, yeah, you can. Number one right. request, kill me in a comic book. Three years. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I just want to be happy. <laughs> this is my only option. Uh, so thank you very much, you guys. Uh, we will see you guys July 5th. Uh, make sure you tell your friends. Make sure you uh, come on down and meet Dan.